Good night, Mr. Alosius Rangga Aditya and SSMM as my lecture for English drama. Let me introduce myself. My name is Pira Anissa Kuma. My seat is 3321169. I want to complete my assignment for English drama. Next. I will talk about famous play writer in Greek and art world. So first is Sophocles in 497 until 405 BC. So the most famous of Sophocles tragedies are those concerning Oedipus and Antigone. These are often known as the Theban plays, although each play was actually a part of different tetralogy. The other members of which are now lost. Sophocles influenced the development of the drama. Among Sophocles, earliest innovation was the addiction of a third actor, which further reduced the role of the chorus and created greater opportunity for character development and conflict between characters. He developed his characters to a greater extent than earlier playwrights such as I.C. Plus. After that, two famous playwrights in Greek and art world is Euripides, born in 484 BC in Athens or Greece, and died in 406 in Macedonia. So the ancient known of 92 plays composed by Euripides, 19 plays are extant. If one disputed authorship is included, at only four festivals was Euripides awarded the first prize, the fourth was two mostly for the tetralogy that included Perchance and Iphigenia at Olympus. So, as you can see in slide, there is um, a picture about Sophocles and Euripides. Next. Famous artwork in from Euripides are Alcestis, Medea, and Hippolytus. Let's move on to origin of tragedy and why the tragic drama becomes famous in the Greek theater. Next. The earliest Greek theaters recall tragedies, your origins in Charles Song sang to local heroes and the Venus. Charles Song were an early Greek performative art in which a large group of people, the chorus in Greek, Literally dance and would dance and sing Rocho's song in honor of God. Choral performances in honor of the god Dionysius evolved into what we know as tragedy. In enduring art form that the Greeks invented in the sector BCE, these performances took place in a large circular orchestra or dancing area in which the chorus performed. The orchestra was simply a fortune pitch of earth and fifth and delimited by a rim of large stones. At the center of the orchestra stood an altar for Dionysius, the pattern god of tragedy. The chorus did not use the altar for the during performance. Instead, the altar acted as a focal point around which the chorus danced and sang. A simple and decorated wooden tent or scheme stood behind the orchestra and provided a place for the chorus to store instruments or other props needed during the dance. Audiences began to attend these performances and orchestra started to be built against hillsides. The rising art formed a natural setting area, a theater, or in Greek, a watching place from which spectators could view the performances. After that, Greek tragedy and Greek theater influenced each other in such a way that the discussion one necessary involves the other. As Greek tragedy developed from hands of praise to local gods to the complex work of Isirus, Sophocles, and Euripides, the theater adapted accordingly. All the while, the theater remained an essentially simple building and affect the way the tragic poets developed their work. In the end, the distinctive features of Greek tragedy and the Greek theater result from interaction between the two. Next. 
and how performed the drama at the Greek theater. Let's talk about it. The early tragedies had one only one actor who would perform in costume and wore a mask, allowing him to impersonate gods. Here we can see perhaps the link to early religious ritual where prostituting might have been carried out by a priest. Later, the actor would often speak to the leader of the chorus, a group of up to 15 actors and all men who sang and danced but did not speak. This innovation is created to test at 520 BCE, or origin of the word thespian. The actor also changed costume during the performance, like using a small tag behind the stage, the skin, which would later develop into a monumental facade and to so break the play into distinct episodes. Later, this would develop into musical interludes. Eventually, Three actors were permitted on stage, but no more a limitation which allowed for equality between poets in competition. However, a play could have as many non-speaking performances as required, so that plays with great financial but King Hall put on a more spectacular production. Due to the restricted number of actors, then each performer had to take on multiple roles where the use of mask, costume, voice and gesture became extremely important. Next. As you can see, this is a example about amphitheater. So I want to talk about amphitheater, the size, the condition, and the diagram of theater. The earliest permanent extent amphitheater is one at Pompeii. It ATBC, in which the arena is sung below the natural level of the surrounding ground. It is built of stone 445 by 341 feet or 136 by 104 meters and seated approximately 20,000 spectators. So this is an amphitheater was a structure built throughout the Roman Empire where ordinary people could watch such spectacles as gladiator games, mock naval battles, wild animal hunts, and public executions. Usually oval uh, in form, the largest examples could set 10 of thousands of people, and they became a focal point of Roman society and lucrative entertainment business. Amphitheaters are one of the best surviving examples of ancient Roman architecture, and many are still in use today hosting events, running from gladiatory enrichment to opera concerts. Next. Let's talk about Dionysius. So who is actually Dionysius? Dionysius was the ancient Greek god of wine, wine making, that cultivation, fertility, ritual madness, theater, and religious ecstasy. His Roman name was Bacchus. He may have been worshipped as early as 1500 until 11,000 BCE by Mycenaean Greeks. As wine was a major part of ancient Greek culture, Dionysius was an important and popular figure in mythology. He was one of 12 Olympians, although he was the last to arrive, and his unusual birth and upbringing marked him as an outsider. A later image and description of Dionysius depict him a metal man, bearded and robed, holding a final staff tipped with a pine cone. However, in later image, the god is shown to be a birthless, tensus, necked or semi naked androgynous god. He is described in literature as womanly or man womanly. As you can see, this is a picture about Dionysius. Next. Let's talk about the famous play writer in Elizabethan theater as two person and art war. So first is Thomas Middleton. Thomas Middleton is born in 18 April 1580 until July 1627. Also spoke Middleton, was an English Jacobian playwright and could. 
he with John Fletcher and Ben Johnson was among the most successful and prolific of playwrights at work in the Jacobian period and among the few to get equal success in comedy and tragedy. His deep stage success was a game at chess in 1625, in which the Black King and his men, representing Spain and the Jesuits, are checkmate by the white knight Prince Charles. So you can see this is a picture about Thomas Middleton. And after that, I want to tell about Christopher Malloy. Malloy's second play was a two-part Tambourine Great in 1587, see, and published in 1590. This was Malloy's first play to be performed on the regular stage in London and is among the first English plays in blank verse. It is considered the beginning of the major pace of the Elizabethan theater and was the last of Marlowe's play to be published before his untimely death. So this is a picture about Christopher Marlowe. Next. So let's move on to famous work from William Shakespeare. First is Hamlet. So what is Hamlet's summary? Hamlet's summary is the ghost of the king of Denmark tells his son Hamlet to avenge his murder by killing the new king, Hamlet's uncle. Hamlet finds madness, contemplates life and death, and seeks revenge. His uncle, fearing for his life, also devises plots to kill Hamlet. The play ends with a duel during the king, queen, Hamlet's opponent, and Hamlet himself are all killed. So the Hamlet is chronologic, chronological plot. Next. So what is characterization of Hamlet? This is a example picture about Hamlet story by William Shakespeare. So first is Claudius. Claudius is a calculating, ambitious politician driven by his sexual appetites and his loss for power, but he occasionally shown signs of good and human feeling. His love for get root, for instance, seems in her. Uh, after that, we have Gertrude, the queen of Denmark. Hamlet's mother, recently married to Claudius, Gertrude loves Hamlet deeply, but she is a shallow, weak woman who seeks affections and seems more urgently than your attitude or truth. After that, Polonius, the lord of Samarlin of Claudius Sword, a pompous, conniving old man. Polonius is the father of Laertes and Ophelia. After that, Horatio, Hamlet's close friend. Horatio is loyal and helpful to Hamlet throughout the play. After Hamlet's death, Horatio remains alive to tell Hamlet's story. Next, about Ophelia. Ophelia. Polonius daughter, a beautiful young woman with whom Hamlet has been in love. Ophelia is a sweet and innocent young girl who obeys her father and her brother Laertes. Dependence on men to tell her how to behave, she gives into Polonius' chance to spy on Hamlet. Even in her life, into madness and death, she remains maidenly, uh, singing song about flower and finally drowning in the river might the flower garlands she had gathered. After that, the gust. The specter of Hamlet recently this is father, the ghost who claims to have been murdered by Claudius falls upon Hamlet to offend him. Next. Let's talk about Othello. Summary of Othello is the place protagonist and hero, a Christian Moor and general of the armies of Venice. Othello is an eloquent and cycly powerful figure, respected by all those around him in spite of his elevated status. He is nevertheless easy prey to insecurities because of his age, his life as a soldier and his race. He possesses a free and open nature which his inside logo uses to twist his love for his wife, Mr. Mona, into a powerful and destructive jealousy. So in Othello, using about chronological plot, as you can see, this is a picture about Othello. So what is characterization of Othello? First is the Demona. 
The daughter of the Venetian senator Brabenzio, this one and Othello are secretly married before the play begins. Well, in many ways, stereotypically pure and meek, Desdemona is also determined and self-possessed. Second is Lago. Lago is Othello's sign, also known as an ancient on or standard bearer. And the violin of the play, Lego is 28 years old, almost ascetic delight in manipulation and destruction person. Third is Misael Casillo. Misael Casillo is Othello's real tenant. Casillo is a young and inexperienced soldier whose high position is much resented by Lego. Truly devoted to Othello, Casillo is extremely ashamed after being implicated in a drunk brawl on Cyprus on losing his place as lieutenant. Labo uses Cassius' yacht, good looks, and friendship with Desdemona to play an Othello in securities about Desdemona's fidelity. After that, Emilia. Emilia is Lago's wife and Desdemona's attendant. A cynical, worldly woman she is deeply attached to her mistress and distrustful of her husband. So let's talk about the condition of England in the Black Death Pledge and how they can solve that problem. As you can see, it's a darkness in England earlier. Yeah. So the condition that is blood and blood shipped out of these strange swellings, which were followed by a host of other unpleasant symptoms such as fever, chills, vomiting, their hair, terrible ash and pains and death in short order death. The bubonic plague attacks the lymphatic system causing swelling in the lymph nodes. The bubonic plague can be treated and cured with antibiotic. So they can solve problem is if you are diagnosed with bubonic plague, you will be hospitalized and given antibiotic. In some cases, you may be put into an isolation unit. Next. So what is obstacle in the Elizabethan period? Let's see. In spite of enduring fascination with the Black Death, even the identity of the disease behind the epidemic remains a point of controversy. Over the 14th century, eyewitnesses describe the disease more contagious and that liar than bubonic plague or Racinia pestis. The bacillus traditionally associated with the Black Death dissident scholars in the 1970s as an 1980 as proposed to typhus or anthrax or mix of typhus, anthrax or bubonic plague as the culprit. The new millennium brought other challenges to the black that bubonic plague links such as an unknown and probably unidentifiable bacillus and Ebola like hemorrhagic fever or at the pseudo scientific Prince of Academia, a disease of interstellar origin. So this is a mini disease during Elizabethan period. After that, proponents of black death as bubonic plague have minimized the differences between modern bubonic and the 14th century plague to painstaking analysis of the black death's movement and behavior and by hypothesizing that the 14th century plague was a hypervirulent strain of bubonic plague, yet bubonic plague nonetheless. The DNA analysis of human remains from known black dead cemeteries was intended to eliminate the but inability to replicate inality positive first load has left uncertainty. Neoanalytical tools used and new evidence Marshalled in this lively controversy have enriched understanding of the Black Death while underscoring the elusiveness or certitude regarding phenomena many centuries past. Next. So let's talk about Puritans. So what is Puritans? So the Puritans were members of a religious reform movement known as Purin 
Puritanism that arose within the Church of England in the late 16th century. They believed the Church of England was too similar to the Roman Catholic Church and should eliminate ceremonies and practices not rooted in the Bible. Puritans felt that they had a direct confidence in with God to enact these reforms. Under such from church and crown, certain groups of Puritans migrated to Northern English colonies in the New World in the 1620s and 1630s, laying the foundation for the religious, intellectual, and social order of New England. Aspects of Puritanism have reverberated throughout American life ever since. So why does the Puritans hate the theater? So this is example of statue about Puritans. So the Puritans disapproved of many things in Elizabethan society, and one of the things they hated most was the theater. The chief complaints was that secular entertainments distracted people from worshiping God. True, they also felt that theaters increasing popularity symbolized the moral in inequality of city life. For instance, they regarded the convention of boy actors playing women's roles as immoral, and some Puritan preachers even felt that the sinfulness of play acting either contributed to or else directly was London's frequent outbreaks of pledge. And surprisingly, Elizabethan playwrights frequently made fun of Puritans. So let's talk about theater, the size, the condition, and diagram of theater in Elizabethan period. So during the early part of the 16th century, there were two distinct types of the theater in England. One was represented by small groups of professional actors who performed in halls, inns, or marketplaces. The location of a play was established by the words and gestures of the actors. The typical Elizabethan stage was a platform as large as 40 feet square, more than 12 meters on each side, sticking out into the middle of the yard, so the spectators nearly surrounded it. It was raised four to six feet and was sheltered by a roof called the shadow or the heavens. In most theaters, the stage roof, supported by two pillars, set midway at the sides of the stage, consist an upper area from which objects could be raised or lowered. At the near of stage was a multifold to proceed with large doors at stage level. There was also a space for discoveries of hidden characters. In order to advance the plot, this was probably located between the doors. Some skins took place in a playing area on the second level of the facade, but again, historians disagree as to which skins they were. Next. So this is an example about theater. So all of the theater buildings were round, square, or octagonal with stage roofs covering the structures surrounding an open courtyard. Spectators, depending on how much money they had, could either stand in the yard, which may have slot toward the stage, sit on bench in the galleries that went around the greater part of the walls, sit in one of the private boxes, or sit on a stool on the stage proper. Next. So the Renaissance period and the effect of the Renaissance. In the Renaissance was a fervent period of European cultural, artistic, political, and economic rebirth following the Middle Ages, generally described as taking place from the 14th centuries to the 17th centuries. The Renaissance promoted the rediscovery of classical science philosophy, literature, and art. Some of the greatest thinkers, authors, statesmen, scientists, and artists in human history thrived during this era, while global exploration opened up new lands and cultures to European commerce. The Renaissance is credited with bridging the gap between the Middle Ages and modern day civilization. So what is the effect of Renaissance? First, 
Greek and Roman texts postured more rational. Scientific approach to theology, the natural world, and the art, human beings, and nature become subject world of study. Second, artists adopt the rational elements of classical learning, such as anatomy and oral perspective, and view the natural world as a path to the divine. Third, many scholars Fought Constantinople after 1453, bringing classical Greek and Roman books and manuscripts to Italy. The, the emphasis on rational truth and science provided a boost to humanism. Fourth, the printing press allowed classical and Renaissance learning to spread quickly throughout Europe. And the last, the Copernican Revolution and Kurik's scientific inquiry. Thank you for your attention.